We are in the capitulation phase, which is a really great time to buy. Hey, it's Anita, and this is the Anita Posh Show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Anita Posh Show and Last Week in Bitcoin. The title for this week is Bitcoin is on sale, and that's good. If you want to try something new, you can now support my work through sending some sats over the Lightning Network by scanning the QR code on the thumbnail of the episode. It's on YouTube in my channel and it's also at anita.link slash 116. This technology is called LN URL and it works with the following wallets. Blue Wallet, Soyuz, SAP, Wallet of Satoshi or BL. W wallet. Now let's talk about the events of the last week. While the speculators have been shaken out by last week's dip in Bitcoin, sub-Saharan Africans are accumulating and using it for their real-life needs and struggles. Bitcoin is up 320% in the last 12 months. When dropping 30%, the media calls it a bloodbath while the real bloodbaths happen in developing nations. 43 countries did not vote for the protection of their people against genocide, ethnic cleansing, war crimes and crimes against humanity at the United Nations this week. The people in these nations need Bitcoin. And now let's talk a little bit about why this price tip is actually a good thing, not only for you and for me, but for all the people in the world. Let's hear it from Kathy D. Wood, CEO of ARK Invest. You never know how low is low when a market gets very emotional. Uh, a lot of traders see Bitcoin uh, dropping below the 200-day moving average. Uh, so traders, once that happened, they just dump. Some just uh, dump and run. Uh, I think we're in a capitulation phase. Uh, Yassine has... Uh, a dashboard. We were looking at all the indicators this morning. They are all suggesting that we are in the capitulation phase, which is a really great time to buy, uh, no matter what the asset is. A capitulation phase is buy. It's on sale. Now, am I saying 35,000 is the low? You know, if traders, uh, and there are a lot of speculators in, in Bitcoin, if they are Uh, running for the hills just because uh, Bitcoin has broken through a moving average that is important to them. It could continue, but uh, all of our indicators are saying this is capitulation right now. So we saw an astonishing Bitcoin price drop of 30%. Media articles have been referring to this as the bloodbath, the carnage, and new entrants to the market, so-called weekends, started panicking and sold their coins. Many saw Elon Musk's dismissal of Bitcoin's energy consumption as the single reason for the dip. While this might have triggered the sale, there were more reasons. Fad. Fear, uncertainty and denial. Those kinds of articles lead to misinterpretations and misinformation. An article spread by Reuters over a new ban for banks to use cryptocurrency in China was published last week. But this regulation is in place since 2017. Another reason might have been that leveraged positions got liquidated. Many firms had bet on Bitcoin using borrowed money. This is okay as long as prices hold steady or rise. But when prices drop significantly, trading houses ask firms to post extra collateral. And if the firms can't do that, their positions will be liquidated to cover their exposure, which adds to the panic. Then we also had uncertainty over Tether's reserves. Tether is a stablecoin packed to the US dollar. Last week, Tether revealed a breakdown of their reserves, which were not reassuring to the critics. This unease might have also added to the price drop. And last but not least, tax day in the US. May 17th was the final day to file taxes for many Americans. Those who actively traded crypto last year likely finished 2021 with a healthy profit. As such, many US crypto holders may have sold a chunk of their portfolio this week to pay Uncle Sam. 
So while we saw a dip of 30% in the last month, at the same time, Bitcoin gained 320% in the last 12 months. For long-term believers in Bitcoin, this was just another drop, just another possibility to buy Bitcoin for a better price. Now, compare this price dip to the value loss of national currencies like the Turkish lira, the Brazilian real, the Russian ruble, the Argentine peso or the Venezuelan bolivar. They lost between 60 to 100% of its value from 2010 to today, while Bitcoin went from zero to 40,000 US dollars without any government help. Now, what's next? I don't know. What I know is that on May 19th, someone bought the dip. Bitcoin worth 750 million US dollars was moved off from exchanges. And, as Kathy D. Wood says, it's a good time to stack some sets. And this is music from Bitcoin artist and next week's interview guest, Rare Skrilla. As the whole world is quantitative easing, Bitcoin's about to be quantitative hard. Keep, keep stacking, keep, keep stacking, keep, keep stacking those sets. Keep, keep stacking, keep, keep stacking, keep, keep stacking those sets. So there's a lot of volatility in the market, and this is good. A new form of peer-to-peer -peer money has to find its value on the free market. It's only natural that it has volatility. Listen to what Mark Yusko, founder and CEO of Morgan Creek Capital Management, has to say. Uh, look, an asset that has compounded at 223% per year for 11 years has to have volatility. It has the same volatility as Amazon stock, 80%. And to your point on, on Bitcoin drawdowns, uh, Amazon, every year in its 24 years of life, has had a double-digit drawdown, including this year. The average drawdown in Amazon stock is 31%, five times over 50%, twice over 90%. When was the right time to sell Amazon? That would be never. So volatility is not your enemy. It's your friend. You want volatile assets. Now, you, what you want is upside volatility. Downside volatility is painful, but over the long term, holding an asset that has volatility is the whole point of investing. As I mentioned in the beginning, 15 countries voted against the United Nations resolution to protect against genocide, ethnic cleansing, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Those are Nicaragua, Zimbabwe, Venezuela, Burundi, Belarus, Bolivia, Russia, China, Egypt, Cuba, Syria. North Korea and Kyrgyzstan. Adding to that, 28 countries abstained from the vote. So millions of people in 43 countries live under authoritarian regimes. Zimbabwe and Eritrea are also on the list of shame. You can listen to my podcast episodes from Zimbabwe and next week I will release an interview with Meron Estefanos, an activist who tells us about the depressing situation of Eritreans. These are the people who need Bitcoin. Sub-Saharan Africa's trading volume is up in 2021. The trading volume on peer-to-peer -peer exchanges localbitcoins.com and paxful.com shows increases up to 6,000% in some of the sub-Saharan African countries in the last 12 months. This thing has just been started and it goes to show that Africans understand the usefulness of Bitcoin. Bitcoin NFTs and the arts. This week's interview guest is Adam B. Levine, the pioneer of Bitcoin podcasting and an early supporter of NFTs. Adam had Meta Coven on his show, who bought people's NFT for 69 million US dollars, the most expensive NFT sold at an auction so far. Here he's talking about the misunderstandings around NFTs. When I think of NFTs, I think of like, um, like a physical key, right? Like a key you put into a lock and, and open it. And the value of a key is that it can unlock things that you don't have access to if you don't have the key. Um, the way I've been kind of describing the period we're in right now for NFTs is that people have figured out that you can paint keys, right? And then they're looking at the, at the painting on the key, right? And they're saying, oh, this is such a pretty key. I value it because of how it looks. But the value of the key is not how it looks. The value of the key is what it does. And so that is what I'm particularly excited about and what I believe is coming in the very near future. 
US regulatory crackdown will spur decentralization. Seems as long as people pay their taxes and stay compliant with laws, the US government will enable innovation in the Bitcoin space. But Bitcoin doesn't care. Decentralized platforms like Sovereign will not be affected by centralized regulations. While I don't encourage breaking the law, in many countries of the world you simply have to break the law and regulations out of necessity. Or you're breaking the law because you're publishing an unwanted truth. See Wikileaks. Caitlin Long, a guest on my show and the CEO and founder of Avanti Financial Group, is summarizing the history of US crypto regulation in a tweet. It's clear, a US crypto regulatory crackdown is starting, but I'm optimistic because most of the major players have spoken already and the policy is taking shape. It's pay taxes, comply with laws and don't take shortcuts and will enable the innovation. It's not a Bitcoin ban. As the whole world is quantitative easing, Bitcoin's about to be quantitative hard. Keeps, keep stacking, keeps, keep stacking, keeps, keep stacking those sats. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Last Week in Bitcoin. I hope you're back next week when it's time again for the Anita Posh Show. If you like it, subscribe to my podcast feed. You can find it in every podcast player. Just search for Anita Posh and hit the subscribe button. And if you want to donate to my work, please send some sats over the QR code that you find on the episode page at anita.link/ 116. If you're a sponsor and you want to sponsor my show, please drop me a line at hello at anitaposch.com. Have a great weekend and see you next week when it's time for Last Week in Bitcoin. Music from Bitcoin artist and next week's interview guest, Rare Skrilla. Content, idea and production, Anita Posch. Keeps, keeps stacking, keeps, keeps stacking, keeps, keeps stacking those sats.